Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you today for uh, many different reasons and with our fellow panelists as well. One of the reasons I'm, I'm honored to be here with you today is uh, a project I've been leading in Univision for the last uh, almost five years. Uh, for the last five years, I've been interviewing uh, uh, people in the streets of Los Angeles, obviously mostly Hispanics. Uh, I've chosen uh, corners at random, uh, set up a, a plastic table with a couple of plastic chairs, and just asked people to sit across the table from me and tell me their life stories. And I've, I've, I've met uh, hundreds upon hundreds of people who have taught me what the immigrant experience is like. When I was first preparing for this panel, I kept going back to a story that I think you will understand very well. Uh, uh, probably a year ago, I met Manuel, an 84-year-old bracero, mm -hmm. who, in my opinion, embodies the immigrant struggles, but also the accomplishments of uh, the 20th century. This is a man who came to California in the 1950s, worked uh, upstate, the lettuce fields upstate, mm, got married here, met his wife here, had children here, made a home here in Los Angeles, bought a home here in Los Angeles. He talked about how the city has changed, and now <coughs> he's fighting for the rights of braceros. Mm -hmm. uh, so an 84-year-old man who was born, lost his mother very, very young when he was 10 years old, fled to the United <coughs> States and began alive here. Like Manuel, I've met many, many people, and that's why I am so honored to be with you today. I will begin with an attempt to connect with the previous conversation. When I first saw Ezra's uh, remarkable documentary, and I think uh, I'm not the only one who, who thinks that he should win the Academy Award for Best Documentary this year, I mean, no questions asked. I, it's, it's really <laughs> fantastic. Although his documentary on uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, if you haven't seen that, it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable as well. Uh, one question kept coming back uh, to me, a question that goes to the heart, I think, of the debate on race and justice in America today. Are we better off? How much progress have we really made? And Lorena, I know that for you this is, this is personal. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, in your own family this life experience of the Bracero program. So I would like to start with you. Are we better off? We're definitely better off. I mean, there, I, I think that nobody who comes from a background, an immigrant background, um, a, a what was once racial minority background, uh, now we're kind of almost together a majority, um, know that the stories of my grandparents or my parents um, were harsher than the stories of today. But that doesn't mean that we've gotten to where we need to go. We just had this, and hopefully people have heard about this great debate we had in California about farm worker overtime. Um, and you know, luckily this week it was signed by the governor for state and the nation. But that conversation itself uh, really brought out a, a lot of experiences and, and thoughts that people don't like to talk about. We had a lot of um, uh, farmers, uh, people whose families were farmers, talking about their thoughts and how well they treat these workers. And then we had a lot of um, Latinos and African Americans who had to keep saying and making people uncomfortable say, uh, farm workers don't get overtime today and don't get normal rights throughout the United States because they started as slaves. That's an uncomfortable discussion to have and a, and a discussion that we haven't had in the last 200 years despite the fact that it's so obvious. The only two groups of people in this country who systematically get left out of wage and hour protections are domestic workers and farm workers. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And until we come to terms with that, and we're starting to here in California, I think, in a very beautiful way, but until we come to terms with our own past and some of the things that, that, our, that our ancestors dealt with, we're never gonna create true justice for, for immigrants today. Let me go back to Manuel Pastor, who's playing the, the role of voice of God today. He's <laughs> playing uh, via audio. Hi, Manuel, how are you? Uh, Manuel, as you know, is, uh, is an expert on, uh, on immigration and on uh, immigrant integration. Uh, in California. So let me, let me ask you the same question, Manuel. Are we, are we better off? Uh, how much progress have we really made uh, over the, la the last uh, decades on that topic specifically? Immigrant integration into the life of, uh, let's focus on California. Well, I'm uh, glad to be with you. I uh, hope I do sound like God as I speak. You do. Um, <laughs> I, I 
know that I, I dressed up for the video, but now it doesn't really make any difference. I could be doing this in my pajamas, so this is really great. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, on the one hand, we've made uh, a lot of progress in terms of our attitudes. Uh, and California, which was, of course, the place that uh, gave birth to a lot of anti-immigrant fervor with Prop 187, and certainly the United States is almost having its Prop 187 moment right now uh, with Donald Trump, has really moved in a direction that is much more positive uh, with regard to driver's licenses for undocumented, uh, the Trust Act, uh, the DREAM Act, and the acceptance that really the 2.8 million immigrants in the state of California who are undocumented are really undocumented Californians. They've been here for a long time. But at the same time, economic progress is very, very uh, challenging. You know, California used to be a place that people came for opportunity. And in 1969, we were, in terms of the United States, about in the middle of the pack in terms of inequality. Uh, since then, we've moved up to being the fourth most unequal state in the United States, outpacing such states as Mississippi and Alabama, places we've always looked to as beacons of opportunity and social justice. So I think we have made some progress on attitudes. We've made some progress on politics. Uh, but we really need to make a lot of progress on economic opportunity and economic justice. That's why the work that just happened uh, with regard to the farm workers and overtime is so important. And that's why the work around raising the minimum wage, which is going to disproportionately benefit workers of color, is so important. Because if we're looking at the California of the future, we need to make sure that these populations are doing well. Uh, Teferi, I, I would love to ask you, um, one of the most interesting debates about immigration now and for a long time is whether or not American workers uh, lose out with the influx of immigrants. It's not a new debate, but it's, it's very important. Uh, what do you think? What, what's your position? Yeah, um, American workers lose out under the current system. Um, it's a system that does not work for migrant workers. It's a system that does not work for regular workers. It's a system set up to um, empower the already empowered, uh, to make the rich even richer. So as a labor movement, um, we realize that. That's why immigration reform for the AFL-CIO is not the number three issue. It's not the number two issue. It is our number one priority in this country. And that is. One, the justice aspect of it, that there's some injustice that's happening, uh, uh, that's happening in this country. The second part of it is really a selfish move on behalf of the labor movement, because we have seen our wages decline for three decades. Stagnant for a long part of it, now we're seeing actually uh, actual wages going down. And if we want to raise wages, and if we want to be respected at the workplace, even as union members. That's, that's gonna be possible as long as you have 12 million people that are being exploited and that have no rights to actually stand up and fight with at, at, at long as. So if we wanna raise our wages, there are two things we have to do, honestly. That is, one, fighting mass incarceration. Two, fighting mass deportation so that everyone has a right and can exercise their right and fight to raise their wages and protect their work pl the, the workplaces. So that's, that's, how, that's how we're viewing it. Um, how are we doing from, from, from that aspect? Uh, as you know, immigration has been a pol political football that has been being played by both sides, honestly, uh, um, to, uh, 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 to this point. Um, uh, in name of uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform, which under the, cl the current climate is never gonna happen, uh, the administration has been deporting more and more and more people to make deal with people who don't want to make deal with you. Mm -hmm. who, don't, who don't just practically don't want to make deal with you. So we have been out since February of 2013 asking the administration to halt deportations and especially to protect the workplace and not to deport people who are challenging their employers either through unionization or th because their, their wages are being stolen. So that, ha that has been our fight. Uh, during the Republican National Convention, I, I spent one whole morning uh, uh, driving through northeastern Ohio, northwestern Pennsylvania, 
uh -huh. the area that, in my opinion, will decide the election, no? And with Pennsylvania, it's very clear now. And people there blame immigrants. I mean, and mm -hmm. economic strife is, is, is serious. I mean, there are places there that will never recover the number of jobs they lost since 2000. And they do blame immigrants. Why, wh what would they, wha what would you tell them? Well, when work when workers are blaming immigrants because they are conditioned to blame immigrants. To, to, bl to blame immigrants. They have been over and over and over again told to, 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 to do that. It's not only about immigrants. It's about we have in this country today a middle class which is blaming everything that's happened to it on the lower class instead of the upper class which is ripping them off on a daily basis. And that just doesn't happen by accident. That's orchestrated. That's orchestrated. So what we're doing is we're going door to door. We're having meetings in our union halls and talking to people who have real complaints, real gr grievances about what's happening in their lives, it's not the immigrant worker that's holding you back. It is the greed of corporate America. It's the greed of uh, 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 a system, the way it is set up, that's, that has been pushing everybody down. And we are trying to educate our members that the only way to get out of the misery that we are in is to empower the 12 million people who have been used to actually pit us against, against one another, and we have to work hand in hand with workers, documented, undocumented, it doesn't matter what your status is. Uh, Anthony, uh, I, I'm going to become more of a journalist now <coughs> and, and ask you this. Uh, so uh, I, I've had the opportunity to, to interview uh, he, both, both Secretary Clinton, and uh, he was still not the candidate for vice president, but uh, 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 Senator uh, Kane. I asked them about immigration reform, and they both said, during the first 100 days, we will introduce immigration reform. Exactly. Is this an empty promise I've with the before. current Congress? Is this an empty promise? you think it can be done? I definitely think immigration is a big topic that we need to address in this country. Um, we're a growing population. Uh, Asian Americans are the fastest growing uh, immigrant population in the country. I think whoever is the next president of the United States needs to account that our, our population is growing, our society is growing. Uh, we need to address the issue of a broken immigrant system that, one, tears up families, that, um, two, exploits immigrant workers, and three, pits uh, communities of colors against each other. How do we make sure um, that whoever is in the White House, whoever is in Congress, whoever is in our state legislature, are all, all accountable to uh, the immigrant community, the people that they serve. Uh, when when, when uh, uh, one has a conversation, for example, with Kevin De Leon, uh, and he's very proud, he's in Mexico now, I think, actually, right. you know? He's very proud of the accomplishments of, of, the, of the assembly and what uh, the legislative branch has done in, in California. Uh, I always ask him, well, that, that's fantastic, but this is a, a democratic state and, and the Congress in Washington is, is not really the same. Uh, so what would your answer be to my question? Is, is uh, immigration reform really feasible with the current makeup of the Congress? I don't think with the current makeup of the Congress, with the Senate, I think um, obviously we could get there. but. You know, and I, and I am defensive of what we've done in California mm -hmm. because we got sick and tired of waiting, right? We know that the lack of immigration reform affects our state the most, um, by and far. We have a quarter of all immigrants. Um, we know this. We live among them. We've accepted this. Post-187, um, we, we had a backlash towards that type of anti-immigrant um, laws, and we dealt with that. So what we've done in California is try to normalize experience uh, of immigrants here, whether or not they have documents, in a way that, that satisfies all the principles that Tafari was talking about. You know, we're trying to make sure that, that they're not subject to wage theft, that they have rights in the workplace, that, um, that they're able to send their kids to school and to college. And by the way, if you, you know, go to college and you pass the bar or, or pass the medical boards, you can actually practice what you've learned. We've done all of those things in California because we've been frustrated. Mm -hmm. Do I have a hope? I do. I have two hopes. One is that eventually we will get immigration reform at the, at the national level, and we will, because numbers eventually will overwhelm. Mm -hmm. I, d I hope it's in my lifetime. But the other thing we hope is that other progressive states like California that could pass these types of protections for immigrants should be doing that. We've been leading the way time and time again, and it's time for other states, Oregon, Washington, who have done some, New York, um, perhaps even Nevada, Arizona, uh, really getting people to a point where they have the political empowerment to start normalizing uh, the lives of immigrants who are here regardless of what Congress does.
So uh, since, since these panels go by so quickly, I want to, to, to touch upon uh, another subject that I find interesting. So Marco Gutierrez, Latinos for Trump, this guy from Northern California. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, quite a character, let me tell you. I, I, I met him in the convention. Quite a character. He was, he was making that sign that he has. It's yeah, quite a character. So the taco truck on every corner comment. We, we, make, fun <laughs> of the, we make fun of the statement. We laugh. Uh, because it, it sounds funny, and we would all love taco trucks on every <laughs> corner. <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, it reflects uh, uh, a long-standing fear uh, uh, of, uh, of a lack of immigrant cultural assimilation. And I, I do think this is a, a very interesting topic. Manuel, I, I, is, is, is this fear of uh, uh, this lack of immigrant cultural assimilation uh, playing a role in the 2016 election, and how so? Well, it certainly is, I and mean, what's interesting is that when you think about the areas you were talking about that have been the most uh, concerned about uh, immigration, say Northeast Ohio and Northwest Pennsylvania, they don't actually have a lot of immigrants. Mm -hmm. So what right. they're really afraid of is things, you know, people who are not in their own midst, and there's certainly a sense of cultural anxiety and sort of a loss of American identity, which is really what's behind that slogan, Make America Great Again. It's targeting back to an earlier era. Um, so that's certainly infecting our politics right now. And if you think about it, for example, the state in the United States that has had some of the most fractious politics around immigration, Arizona, happens to have the whitest elderly and the most Latino uh, youth population of any state in the United States. So there's a sort of generational disconnect and fear that's going on as well. Um, I do think that there's another phenomenon going on in this election, and it does uh, kind of lead to maybe a more positive sign. You may have read that just yesterday, the uh, Citizenship and Immigration Statistics reported that applications for naturalization are up 36% over the previous year. That is that a lot of immigrants who are lawfully in the country, but who have postponed the idea of becoming a US citizen, have been angered by the tone of the rhetoric and are going to register and vote uh, in this election. And the newly naturalized actually tend to vote at higher rates than the U.S. form because they tend to naturalize in a period of political fervor and they're pissed off and they really want to make sure that their vote counts. Um, so I think that this is a phenomenon that will take place in this election. And then moving forward, you know, uh, when we think about the year 2020, which is a year in which there's a presidential election again that will bring more minority than young voters, it's a year in which we have the census, and it's the year that sets the, the, uh, the sort of demographic and political framework for redistricting. That next decade is going to be a very different decade in terms of the congressional receptivity to comprehensive immigration reform. I, I think this, this topic of how you fight nativism in the age of uh, algorithms and, and Facebook and Fox News and social media is, is to me fascinating. I don't know, uh, Anthony, if you have... Uh, 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 thoughts, thoughts on this because I, 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 again, like Manuel says, even though even after the election, this is going to stay with us. It won't, it won't leave with Trump if he leaves. Because now, I mean, uh, yeah, and, and the room goes shh, quiet. <laughs> 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 don't worry, don't worry. The debates are coming up. What, what's, what's your, your <laughs> please? What's your take on this, Anthony? I definitely think, um, like Manuel mentioned, right, um, the example you mentioned around Pennsylvania, how there's not a lot of immigrants in that state, and I think it's a r about humanizing who immigrants are, um, how we all come here wanting a better life, um, also acknowledging the fact that some of us are forced to, to migrate because of economic crises in our countries, or, or wars, or, or um, different situations, right? And I think, how do we really connect to one another as human beings? Because all we want to, to do is to be able to provide for ourselves and our families. And I think uh, my, my parents made the, the most difficult decision in the world to um, migrate from the Philippines um, in 2001 to, to give a better life for me. Um, and I think that's about what immigration reform is about, is making sure families are able to sustain themselves. Um, I thank the, the California legislature for allowing many immigrants in this, in this state to be able to be fully integrated, regardless of immigration status. I'm undocumented, um, so I was able to go to school here, but my friends in, in, in different states aren't able to, right? I think it's about uh, humanizing that aspect of policy, right? You, you create laws, but what does that really mean in the day-to-day -day lives of people when people don't have health care, when people die because they can't go to, to um, the hospital, 
because they don't have um, access to health insurance or they have to choose between um, going to school or, or, or being homeless. And it, that's the real impact of a global immigration system and that's the impact of an immigration system or a policy that doesn't include immigrants of all backgrounds, whether you're Latino, you're, you're black, you're, you're LGBTQ, you're a woman. Like it impacts us in different ways. Uh, I think I remember when I got into this work, all I wanted was really like I wanted to, to, to work to get my papers. And honestly, the past four years has been transformative to the fact that really I need to, I, I'm in this work to transform the country, to erase injustice, to work with, with my brothers and sisters in different communities to ensure that all of us are able to live the lives that we want to. I think that's, that's, that's the thing about uh, doing this work is we want to be able to live our most authentic lives and, and policies that we have right now don't allow us to do that. Uh, we, we, I think we should get probably a couple of questions from the, from the audience. We're going to talk about California's workforce, but now we veered into cultural issues and all that. Well, okay. very uh, So uh, my name is uh, Mauricio Motz, and I think my question is, and whoever wants to answer is like, why I feel that the U.S. press has a much deeper and has even more fascination and interest to cover the refugee crisis in Europe in depth than to <laughs> cover the immigration crisis in the U.S. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. You wanna, you wanna, uh, good, good thing you brought that up. I, I have the biggest honor of my life practically on Monday. Um, I will be uh, addressing the UN in New York specifically on this issue, on this issue. That directly goes to American exceptionalism. I am a refugee myself. I, re I uh, came to the United States. Uh, I left my country of Ethiopia when I was 13 years old, walked on foot across the, across the desert, and I was in a refugee camp in the Sudan, and I got a political asylum to come to, come to this country. Guess what? The United Nations processed me. UNHCR was there to process and to do the work. Uh, but you have a large amount of immigrants coming to this country, refugees coming into this country from specifically three Central American countries. Our government refuses to call them refugees to start out with. That should start, we, we should start with that. They are refugees. They are refugees who are being displaced by our own trade agreements with the Central American Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> who, are being, who, who, are, who are being run down by gangs and lawlessness in their own country and they don't have any opportunities. That's the real definition of actually what refugee is. Now, our government has set up a shop in Mexico using the Mexican soldiers to actually do processing. And not only Mexico, now they just started also a shop in Costa Rica to process people. But they would not allow UNHCR to do its work because we are America and we don't allow the UN to do its work. People with guns are not qualified to process refugees. And we have to talk, when we talk about refugee crisis, we have to start from our own hemisphere. It's easy to talk about Jordan and Syria and cry a river about it. But in our own hem hemisphere, because charity starts at home, and we have to start here. Were, were, you, were, you, happy to see, uh, were you happy to see Donald Trump in uh, Mexico City with the uh, Mexican <laughs> president? Did you think that was a great idea? It, it elevated oh, oh, uh, Are you my the view fifth? of the president. <laughs> of Mexico, yeah. and now he's right there with Trump. Um, Oof. Well, Nieto Peña's, yeah, we yeah, can yeah. have our own. No, uh, I, I, know, I mostly own. agree with you. I know, I know. <laughs> Mo most Mexicans do. Yeah. Um, that's what I think a lot of the American press didn't understand. This is not a popular president who makes smart decisions and has been looking out for his own people. And so um, for me, it was just a reflection of, of uh, something that's gone awry in Mexico and now has a possibility of, of going much worse in the United States if we even validate this man who seems to think he's a valid candidate for president. Please. Oh, thank you. Um, Kristen Glover, I'm a member of a labor union under the AFL-CIO, so my question is directed primarily to Mr. Is it Gerber? Gerber. Uh, Gerber. Um, how do you feel the if the Trans-Pacific Partnership were to pass, how would it affect uh, labor in the United States, wage equality, and, and immigrants, and if you have a, a view on why is President Obama pressing for it? Uh, let me start from the, <laughs> let me say I don't know why, <laughs> on, on, the, on the last question that you have, why the president is, 
so insistent on this thing, which the entire base, which got him elected, is opposed to this draconian free trade agreement called the, 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 the Trans-Pacific tra free, tra free, free Trade Agreement. So you will see if this thing passes, you will see an explosion of more refugees around the world. It will just, this is not a trade agreement. This is a financial transaction with multiple, multiple countries without having any regard for workers, without having any regard for the environment that we live in, without having any regard for local control. And that is really the basics of it. We lose our democracy first from Flint to everywhere else. Then they rip you off of everything else that you have. So this is a very dangerous thing. If you have not called your congressman and senators, pick up your call, phone, and call them. And we hear that they're trying to pass the TPP during the dead session after, 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 after the election. We can't let them do that. But for all of these things, brothers and sisters, it's not really about politics. It's about a movement. It's about a movement. I want to take you back to 2006. When in Los Angeles, where I used to live here, when we had real immigrant right movement. Before whatever national organizations, before we took it national and we took it away from immigrants. You want to have a solution for immigrants? Have immigrants in the room talking about it. You, have a way, you, you, you want to have a solution about mass incarceration or African American community? Let African American community lead that conversation. I know we all mean well. But we need to create a space for people, movement-oriented people, to actually lead our fights. And workers around the world are fighting back against the TPP. And I'm confident that finally we can kill this zombie. Uh, I don't know if there, there was a question over here. And uh, the, 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 the clock just stopped. So I don't know how much time you, we, ha we have left. No Guys, if you could no help more. me. No more time? No more time. Uh. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.